see more, so no more. They want shady. I'm chopped liver. Well, if you want shady, this All right, well, I'm here's getting. shady. A little bit of weed. I'm Jay Huber, and I'm back. Back at Rebel Headquarters. Fun for everybody. JR Jackson's also back. JR, I don't think that people didn't notice you uh, in the corner of the screen uh, during that drug segment we did on the Dylan Radigan show. Uh, that picture was captured by one of the Young Turks listeners, and it was tweeted out, and then it was retweeted. So uh, it lives in the tweetosphere. I didn't, I didn't uh, have any knowledge of this. Yeah, yeah, it happened. It happened. <laughs> and I just joined. See, this is the problem. If, you, if you're in something that people are doing on Twitter, you should kind of be notified. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't uh, you know what? I, w- as I, I wasn't, was, I wasn't hashtagged and tagged and, and relit and hung up and whatever the hell they do on Twitter. I, 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 I'm very happy that you were not hung up, and, and I, don't, I don't think you were lit up either. <laughs> whatever they do. Now, look, uh, I'm, you know, I, all over Twitter, right? Except I still don't know when I retweet how to include your tweet and the address and da da da. Anyway, it's out there somewhere. You can probably find it on our website. All right, Jesus is here as usual, of course. We got a great show ahead for you guys. Um, we've got um, income inequality. Now, look, look, look here. Okay, this is in the immortal words of Steve Ducey. Huge. Now, finally, people are getting around to talking about this, and it's it's uh, it, it's pretty determinative of how our economy goes and how our country goes. I'm going to show you some amazing numbers on that a little bit later in the program. And then we got great Republican dirty tricks on the program. Uh, and then we've got pop stars saying terrible things. That's in the second hour. Got too much show. Too much show. All right, so now let's get started, okay? By the way, I was on Dylan Radigan's show earlier today. You know I do it every Tuesdays around between 4.30 and 5. Uh, I did this rant on uh, uh, our public education, what needs to be done, etc. You can check it out on, uh, on our YouTube channel, of course, youtube.com slash the Young Turks. But my main point, which I, you know, the reason I bring it up now is because I wanted to reemphasize it. Get straight A's, okay? Shut up and get straight A's. That's all I'm saying, okay? By the way, uh, I'm not just telling you that. I'm uh, telling my nephews the same thing. They're like, oh yeah, but I got this. Blah 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 blah. blah, blah. And shh, shh. www.shish.com. Straight A's. That's all, okay? That gives you a lot more options. Now you don't want to have those options, then don't get straight A's. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so now we move on. All right, look, uh, political season is upon us. Uh, Barack Obama's out there campaigning for Democrats. He's obviously not up for re-election, but uh, in the entire House is, and a third of the Senate is. So he's got to go finally make his case. And he is. It's back to, uh, you know, campaign season, and it's a little refreshing. You know what? Here, let's share some clips for you guys. Uh, look at clip number one here where he goes after the Republicans. But there are some folks in Washington who see things differently. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when it comes to just about everything we've done to strengthen our middle class, to rebuild our economy, almost every Republican in Congress says no. Even on things we usually agree on, they say no. If I said the sky was blue, they say no. If I said fish live in the sea, they'd say no. (laughs) They just think it's better to score political points before an election than to solve problems. So they said no to help for small businesses, even when the small businesses said we desperately need this. This used to be their key constituency, they said. They said no. No to middle class tax cuts. They say they're for tax cuts. I say, okay, let's give tax cuts to the middle class. No. No to clean energy jobs. No to making college more affordable. No to reforming Wall Street. They're saying right now, no to cutting more taxes for small business owners and helping them get financing. I, you, you know, I, I heard what, somebody out here was, was, was yelling, yes, we can. Remember that was our slogan? Yeah. Their slogan is, no, we can't. <laughs> no, 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 no. More accurately, I believe their slogan is, hell no, you can't. So, 
just to be clear on the record. So look, he's going after the Republicans, finally, thank God, okay, making his own case. The one part I didn't like was he said they're trying to score political points before an election. No, you're trying to score political points before an election. They've been trying to score political points the entire two years. That's the difference. And that's why uh, the Democratic Party is getting its ass handed to them in the latest polls, because you just got started a couple of days ago. They've been going for two years. Got all oh, the Democrats, they're the worst, they're the worst, they're the worst. We vote no, no, no. They're killing your jobs. They're not helping the economy. They're trying to raise taxes. They're the worst, 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 until people start to believe it. And now you guys started a couple of days ago, and you think you're going to catch up. Well, good luck to you. You know, and I mean that because I think the alternative of Republicans winning is disastrous, right? I wish you'd been doing this a hell of a lot longer. Why? Is it because I like cheap political rhetoric? No, because if you have a one-sided argument, the American people are not going to get an accurate view of where the country is. And it's not cheap political points to say, look, here's what the Democrats have accomplished, here's what the Republicans have accomplished. You know, he goes to his cars in the ditch analogy. Well, you should have been saying that for two years. Say, look, I, they put me in the ditch. They put me in the ditch. They put me in the ditch. I'm trying to get out. Help me get out. All right, let's work together to get out. But you know who put us in this economic ditch? The Republicans did. Now, he's saying it now. God bless. He should have been saying it for two straight years. He played patty cakes. And now I got polls showing the Democrats in the House could get wiped off the board. Okay? So, but he's going in the right direction here. I love the random ones, the sky is blue, that's good, that's what I say all the time. Do fish live in the sea? I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> but that's a good one, that's a good one, I like that, because I believe they do. Although the Republicans would probably differ. And do you, you notice Obama, as he does these speeches, has a little more, you know what I'm saying, in his voice, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like in his interview with ABC, etc., he's not going to say, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now that he's talking to people, all of a sudden, you know, he's rolled up the sleeves and he's one of the folks. <laughs> Politicians, man, they kill me. All right, so let's let's show you the other part of what he was saying. Clip number two. That's been at the heart of what we've been doing over these last 20 months, building our economy on a new foundation so that our middle class doesn't just survive this crisis. I want it to thrive. I want it to be stronger than it was before. And, and over the last two years, that's meant taking on some powerful interests. Some powerful interests who have been dominating the agenda in Washington for a very long time, and they're not always happy with me. No, sometimes they are. They talk about me like a dog. That's not in my prepared remarks, it's just, but it's true. You know, that's why, that's why we passed financial reform, to provide new accountability and tough oversight of Wall Street. You know, even as he's getting tougher, he can't help but hedge himself, right? He says, they attack me like a dog. I said, wow, that's strong language. Nicely done, right? And he's, I had seen that he had said that in a headline before I started watching the speech. And then after he says it, he can't help himself. He says, oh, that's not in my prepared remarks because he knows Fox News and said are going to attack him. So to say, hey, look, I didn't plan to say this, it just kind of slipped out. Uh, but it's true, but it's true. If you're going to hit him, just go ahead and hit him, man. All right, but anyway, look, positive, positive. We're making progress, going after the Republicans a little bit. Is two months going to be enough to turn this thing around so that people remember, oh, yeah, right, wait, ho wait a minute. Who caused the collapse in the first place? I'm telling you, this ain't about politics. It's about reality. The Republicans caused the collapse. So do you want them back in charge? I don't. Okay. And you know I got problems with Obama. <laughs> but uh, why do I want the guy who uh, started the, uh, the collapse in the first place? And so the question is now, uh, is this uh, Republican Party any different than the Republicans that caused the collapse, the Bush uh, years? <laughs> I think the answer is hell no, they're not any different. But you know what? When asked, 58% of Americans said, oh, yeah, they're different. This the Republican Party is different than the one that was there two years ago that caused the collapse. Based on what? Based on what? 58%. Now, see, that's what I'm talking about. The Democrats never made their case. Nobody should think that. 8% of the country should think that. Because even the Republicans say, oh, yeah, our ideas are the same exact damn ideas. 
tax cuts for the rich, and no to anything Democrats say. That's their ideas. They fess up to it. So why don't you let the American people know that? I, I'm worried it might be too late, but let's go to Axelrod. He's finally caught on to this because he's the president's you know, political advisor, so he's a political genius. Um, so first, he just comes to him almost as a surprise. He finds out that the Republicans have been against him all along. Really? All right, here's what he says. I think realistically what you have is a Republican Party that is now thoroughly focused on one thing, and they have been, frankly, from the beginning which is to try to regain power, really. And their strategy is to lock everything down and not let anything happen. To which I say, of course, of course. But David, I hope you didn't realize this yesterday. You know, I hope you realized this earlier. But seriously, as I read the article of his interview, it, it almost seems like it was a surprise to him. Like, Did you know that the Republicans have been opposed to everything? That's really weird. We didn't see that coming. Well, we just realized, well, well, boy, boy, we better let the American people know about that. Well, I agree, David. I agree. Way to be a great political advisor. So, now here's the second part of it. Finally recognizes, hey, maybe we had a failure to communicate here. It says, quote, perhaps this is where we've been failing to communicate, referring to that 58% number that I told you, where in an NBC a Wall Street Journal poll, uh, the public thinks Republicans would have different policies than President Bush. It says, we've had a, been failing to communicate, Axelrod continues, a large number of people don't believe that the Republican Congress would go back to the policies of George W. Bush, even though their own leaders have said as much in public. Pete Sessions said we want to go back to the same exact agenda that was there before this president took office. So our job in the next eight weeks is to make sure that people understand that, that they understand the stakes. I agree completely, except for one small part. Could you tell what part that was? In the next eight weeks. Hey, good luck to you. I mean, this is the brilliant political advice Obama's getting. Hey, let's wait till the last eight weeks. And then at the, be, while, after we see a poll that says, oh, my God, 58% of the country doesn't understand what the Republican Party stands for at all, and they totally forgot who caused the collapse, okay, then let's panic and then decide, oh, let's go get them. You should have been going to get them from day one. Every time you reached out, they slapped your hand away. And that didn't just deliver the message home to you? Look, you know what the other possibility is, okay? Well, one possibility is that these uh, guys are quite naive, right? And, you know, the more I read, the more I think, well, maybe they are. Jesus, God, because this sounds ridiculous, right? Of course, the other possibility is they, this old strategy of, oh, we're reaching out to the Republicans. Oh, but they didn't play ball. Oh, they twist my arm. Oh, they twist my arm. Oh, I had to give everything away to corporate America. Oh, what could I do? The drug companies, they had to make, you know, they had to... Have the same exact monopoly they did under Bush. The private insurance companies still have no competition, can raise your rates any way you like. The banks are still in charge. Oh, no, the Republicans made me do it all. So it's all a big game. It's all a big game. And then in the last eight weeks, the Obama and his team goes out there and says, okay, wait a minute now. Game on. And, you know, before, oh, we were so naive. Golly gee, Willikers. We thought these guys were going to play ball, but it turns out they didn't. They made us do all these terrible things, these corporate deals we didn't want to do. But now I'm going to remind you how bad the Republicans are and how they're in favor of corporate America and the richest people in the country. Well, that's true. <laughs> but your part, eh, not as true. All right, so uh, along those lines, something that uh, Barack Obama just mentioned there in the clips that we played for you, he said uh, $30 billion uh, to small businesses, and the Republicans say no, right? Now, the Republicans are the ones that pushed for this in the first place. It's tax breaks, $30 billion worth, to small businesses. And the Republicans say no. Now, why do the Republicans say no? Of course, it's because they don't want anything to pass. And they don't want anything that could actually help the economy. Because if the economy is improved and you get more jobs, well, you're less likely to be disgruntled at the party in power, which is the Democrats. So... You know, when you talk about how heinous the Republicans are, <laughs> you're not going to find too many people in the country uh, that, could, uh, that are going to agree with you more than me. But when you get to the Democrats, let me give you one more quote about Axelrod. He said, you know, look, we've accomplished so much. I know people wanted more. And like, your small quote here. So, well, if you've, he thinks everybody asks, 
Well, if you got that done, why couldn't you get this done? If you got health care done, why couldn't you get energy reform done? If you got financial reform, why couldn't you get something else done? No, no, that's, you see, that's what I'm talking about. That leads me to thinking they're not naive. They're just playing with us, right? Because no, they, nobody's saying, hey, you know what? Barack Obama had to get everything done. He had to get uh, immigration done. He had to get Ira out of Iraq and Afghanistan and have zero troops there by the end of you know, 2010. Okay, who's saying this? Uh, and he also had to you know, fix every you know, violation of gay rights in the country. And he had to do this, 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 this. And he had to get every single thing done. No, nobody thinks that. And we understand that that's not realistic. What we wanted you to do is in the things that you went for, to actually go for them. So if you were going to do financial reform, to actually do financial reform. I got a story on that in, in just a little bit. You know what? I'll throw it in right now, okay? Just because we're having fun. Uh, Michael Burry is one of the top investors that were uh, that just absolutely scored in this whole mortgage meltdown because he saw it coming. And he bet against the mortgages. He was a guy who was featured in um, The Big Short, a book by Michael Lewis. You know how much he made uh, money, how much return he had for his investors betting the right way during the market meltdown? Uh, I think it was 489% return. So he made, if, they, if you put in $100 with uh, Burry, you got out $500. Except they didn't put in 100 they put in a lot more, right? So this guy knows exactly what he's talking about. He was the one who was first, who figured it out first. He's the one that made the largest bets, et cetera, et cetera. You know what Burry's doing now? I read this uh, in uh, one of the business magazines. Let me see if I have it for you right here. Yeah, here it is, and it is in Bloomberg. Okay, and uh, Michael Burry is investing in three different things, and this gives you a sense of uh, what kind of where our economy is headed. And by the way, so far, based on what I read from Michael Lewis, actually, and uh, and a couple other sources, Burry's never really been wrong. You know, anybody can be wrong on micro issues, but on macro issues, the big bets he's made, he's not been wrong, okay? Uh, he's betting on gold, small tech companies in Asia, and farmland. Okay, well, why am I telling you this, okay? Here's why. First of all, small tech companies in Asia, that makes sense. You've got a lot of growth in Asia. Those tech companies can blow up, make a lot of money, give you a great rate of return. That's just an investment uh, decision. Makes perfect sense. But the two that are macro pictures that give you a sense of the impending doom is he doesn't believe in the value of the dollar. He thinks that we, uh, you know, that what we are doing will lead to apparently an economic collapse. Now, look, I'm filling in that detail. I want to be clear on that. What he says is, hey, I'm going for the dollar. I see more trouble. I'm sorry. I'm going for the gold. I see more trouble ahead. If you invest in gold, that means you don't believe in the dollar, okay, roughly speaking. That means you think, hey, the U.S. might not be able to pay its loans back, and the dollar might lose some value. These are among the things. But, okay, but gold, you know, a lot of people bet on gold these days. In times of economic instability, gold's a, something that makes sense, okay. I'm being to sound like Glenn Beck. Okay, they are not our sponsors. I'm just telling you what the reality is. Now, but the third one is the one that blows my mind. He's investing in farmland where they have a lot of water. You know why? Because farmland where you actually grow stuff and you have access to water is the one place that is going to retain value. That means he thinks nothing else is going to retain value. Okay? Because we know how we've talked about in the past when I tell you doom and gloom about what's going to happen to the economy. What's going to, you know, what are you going to do with your money? If you keep it in the bank, it might be in trouble, right? If you Put it in real estate, real estate's going to go down, you're in trouble, don't keep your house, don't buy commercial real estate, well then where the hell are you going to put your money, right? And one of the few th places left is farmland. I mean, if one of the top investors in the country, the guy who's been right about everything, it thinks it's so bad that he's got to invest in farmland, I, I, look, I, I could be blowing it out of control, but to me that's a terrible, terrible sign. Now why do I tell you that now? It's because... Look, Obama didn't give us real financial reform. The smartest guys in the country still think we're going to crash. And so when Axelrod comes around and says, oh, you know what, oh, these guys wanted everything, and just because we got you a little bit instead of a lot, they're complaining, and when they should be so thankful for all the things that we've gotten done. 
I'm not buying it, man. And I think you might have gotten only a little bit done because that's what the people in power wanted. And that's how you get your political contributions, etc. But that's also why we're going to crash. And then you're going to come crying to me later. And when you do, by the way, the next time around, I'm not going to say the Republicans caused the crash. Did they help? Did they aid and abet? Did they do it in the first place? Yes. Are they aiding and abetting now by protecting the big banks and being even further to the right of Obama? Yes. But if this economy crashes again because you didn't do real financial reform, well, the Democrats and Obama crashed it at least as much as the Republicans. All right. Well, now you go listen to their little campaign speeches and you sort it out for yourself. All right. Look, when we come back, I've got more on, uh, uh, on the economic situation uh, but, and the income inequality and how that makes a difference, but also what is Obama's latest proposal. We'll give that to you when we return. All right, back on the Young Turks. A uh, small uh, side note here. Who isn't excited about the football season? Oh, Thursday night. Are you ready for some football? Okay. All right. God bless America. Now, uh, let's uh, go back to politics. So uh, what, what kind of damage can the Democrats expect in uh, 2010 elections? Well, uh, they had a gathering of uh, about uh, 5,000 political science experts in the American Political Science Association, and they had 900 panel and roundtable sessions. I love political science, but wow, 900 of them? <laughs> it's even a bit much for me. Uh, but uh, they came out with some of the top experts in the country with predictions for how many seats the Democrats would lose in 2010, and the answer is devastating. First of all, you have to understand right now, uh, Democrats hold a 256 to 179 seat advantage. That's big, big. I thought it would take a while to erode that. Apparently, I was wrong. Well, the Re Republicans need to flip 39 seats in order to gain control of the House. 39 seats is a lot of seats. So what's the range that the top five reports gave? Well, uh, the lowest one was the Democrats will lose 22 seats. The highest one was that they would lose 52 seats. And the consensus is that it is likely to be in the high 40s. Elbow from the sky. Man, Democrats suck. All right, moving on. I mean, come on, man. You can't make the case that the Republicans are the one that caused the collapse. Why the hell would we let them back in charge? You can't make that case. You're going to lose... To 22 to 52 seats in the House? How about you do what you said you were going to do? How about you actually try to change? Ah, ah what, are they? what are they? Listening? They're not listening. Okay, so now uh, what's Obama's uh, last second plan here? You know, the Congress is going to come back in September, and they still have some time to try to help the economy, et cetera. Um, well, of course, they're going to ask the Republicans if they can help, and they're going to get this answer. Hell no, you can't! Everybody knows it. Okay, in fact, John Boehner is saying it today. Mitch McConnell is saying it today. They're like, no to any and all proposals, right? So, uh, for example, uh, what Obama is going to propose is $30 billion to the small businesses, right? Republicans proposed it originally. Now they say no. Then he's got a new proposal for $50 billion in infrastructure spending uh, that is going to go towards um, permanent expansion of uh, Actually, let me get to that in a second, but let me fill the, out the details for you. Uh, it's going to go towards 150,000 miles of roads, building and maintaining 4,000 miles of rail lines, and 150 miles of airport runways, and installing a new air navigation system to reduce travel times and delays. Okay, sounds lovely. Uh, what do the Republicans say? And you know it. Hell no, you can't! Nope, of course not. And then he says, all right, look, how about I allow a business write-off? of 100 percent for new equipment that businesses invest into. Okay? Now that could cost us in the short term, in the next two years, 200 billion dollars. And it goes directly into corporations. Now come on Republicans, you gotta love that, right? It's a giant tax cut for your best friends. Answer is... Hell no you can't! Now, why? Why? You argued for the small business thing before. You argued for the tax cuts for the business before. Why now? No. But we were before an election when we want complete and utter economic disaster. So we can turn around and go, ha ha, look at what the Democrats did. 
There's a Republican strategy for you. And, of course, uh, would I have gone in that direction? Look, as far as tax breaks go, first of all, the, for new equipment makes sense, okay? It's not that I wouldn't go in that direction. I get the logic of it, right? They get to uh, depreciate all that I immediately so that you have an immediate benefit, so it gives you an incentive because if you have new equipment, new factories, et cetera, you might hire more people. At least it's directed in a logical way. And they talk about uh, permanent expansion of research and development tax credits for companies. These things are pretty logical. I don't know that I would give as many tax cuts as Obama is because I'm really worried about the deficit, right? And, and it's still an indirect way to get to creating jobs. For example, Paul Krugman wrote about it today and says, look, here's how you can create jobs quicker. Instead of giving it to private corporations in the form of tax breaks and hoping that they create jobs with the money you're basically giving them, why don't you just take the money and hire people for more infrastructure spending? As an example, he says $50 billion is, in his opinion, very, very low. He's like, and you know what? And Krug makes a great point here. He said, you think the Republicans are going to pass this or help you to pass it? Of course not. They're not going to allow it, right? And the conservative Democrats are going to go along with the Republicans, and they're going to kill this thing. And Krugman says, look, if they're going to kill it anyway, why didn't you ask for more money so at least you can go to the American people and say, look, I tried to create jobs for you right now. I was going to spend all this money and, and, and hire you, right? And the Republicans wouldn't let me do it. Why do you propose a half measure right before an election, one that you know is going to get beat down anyway? Because Obama still thinks, oh, no, look, aren't I reasonable? Look, I gave them everything they wanted. I gave them the research tax credit. I gave them the immediate write-offs for new equipment. I gave them the small business loans. Uh, you know, aren't I reasonable? Stop trying to appease the Republicans and start attacking them. <laughs> and it's not for politics. It's so that the American people are not misled. They know who created the problem. They know that who's blocking the solutions. Now, Obama's doing that a little bit today, as we explained earlier, but I would go a hell of a lot further, not just in the politics of it, but in the proposals, because these proposals are not good enough. The financial reform was not good enough. And, you know, both Axelrod and Obama said, look, we wish there was a magic silver bullet to help improve the economy, but there isn't, right? You know what that reminds me of? Reminds me of Bush going, I wish I had a magic wand. That's it. Good economy. Right? Now, I get it that there's no silver bullet. I know that you can't just flick a button. Is that how you would flick a button? I think you press a button and you flick a switch. Anyway, <laughs> I, I wish, I, I know that there isn't such a thing, right? But it doesn't mean that you did everything you could. And even if you think, like, and I don't think they did, as I explained, but even if you think, hey, you know what, all that stuff we tried and that was the best we can do, how about going forward, you say, all right, you know what? I, there's no magic bullet, but here's what I'm going to do and hope that something sticks. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? All right. I hope you know what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. So, uh, by the way, uh, they rightly point out that 1.5 million businesses and several million people would benefit from all these tax breaks, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, the Republicans, since they're low sim, always say no. Okay. So now we go to... Um, uh, Peter Orszag, because this is very interesting, uh, Orszag was the former director of the Office of Management and Budget. And so he was, the, as Bush would say, he was this Obama's budget man, right? So now there were some questions as to whether he was a progressive or he was a conservative. Which direction did he want to go? And, and I remember people arguing about it back and forth, and I, I didn't have good uh, direction on it. We didn't have good reporting on it, so I wasn't really sure, right? Um, so now we know. Now why do we know? Because Orzak has now started um, a New York Times column. So he writes a column for New York Times. He wrote his first one today, and I read it, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. So first he starts talking about how, um, look, let's reach a compromise on tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts. So first that was instantly, I was like, oh, compromise. Yeah, compromise usually means let's do what the Republicans want. Uh, and then maybe later we'll get a tiny bit that the progressives want, right? But it, doesn't, but it doesn't have to mean that, so I'm reading the rest of the article, seeing what he has to offer. He says, all right, look, let's do this, right? We should end all of the Bush tax cuts, including for the middle class and everyone else. I agree with that, because I'm a deficit hawk, right? Now, a lot of liberals don't agree with that. They think we should do 
tax cuts for the middle class, the poor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Uh, but Orzag says, in order to get that compromise, let's also extend the tax cuts for the rich for two years. I said, all right, look, now this is beginning to sound really fishy uh, because compromise involves, of course, tax cuts for everybody, including the super rich. Uh, but then here comes the kicker. He says, don't worry, we'll set them to expire. And then in 2013, the tax cuts for the rich, along with everyone else, will naturally expire without any congressional action. Did you catch it? 2013. What happens in 2013? We have a new president. And if it's a Republican president, well, golly gee willikers, those tax cuts for the rich that we just maintained throughout Obama's entire term because of the so-called compromise, guess what? They will be extended for tax cuts for the rich forever. So this is a way to get the ball down the street so that you don't actually raise taxes on the rich. You keep them at the level that crashed the economy under Bush, that destroyed and pulverized our economy under a so-called compromise. Then I read more about Peter Orzak after I read his editorial. Some progressives saying that it is, quote, an outrage to consider Orzag a progressive. He has never been one. In fact, internally, in the Obama White House, he'd been arguing for the least progressive positions you could imagine. Hey, you know, we've got a deficit problem. Let's balance the deficit on the back of the middle class. Let's keep the tax cuts for the rich going, et cetera, et cetera. So that's Peter Orzak, who was Obama's budget director. Okay. Now, the good news is he's no longer the budget director. Hey, we're making progress. Okay. So it turns out it wasn't just progressives who left the Obama administration. It was also Peter Orzag who apparently is, you know, he would consider himself, I'm sure, a moderate, but based on his uh, policy proposals and what he proposes now and what we find out he proposed while he was in, office, while he was in the White House is not at all uh, a moderate, is a conservative, and is a disaster. So the fact that he has left the Obama White House is very good news. I'll take my good news where I can find it. Okay. And... By the way, as he puts that compromise out there, I think, oh, no, here comes the compromise where the rich get to keep their tax cuts forever, right? Unless, of course, a Democrat wins and then has the nerve to raise taxes on the rich in 2013, right? But good note on that, too. I don't want to be overly pessimistic, and I want to tell you what the reality is. Uh, the White House came out right after this editorial with a statement saying, no go, no compromise, we will be raising the taxes to back what they were under the Clinton administration when we had an awesome economy, okay? So, and that's only on the top 2%. So, I would call that two pieces of good news on the Obama administration. Making progress. A lot of Bush quotes today. All right, I, I got a, you know what, let me take a break here. Because everybody catch your breath. Two things when we come back that's fantastic, all right? One, the Republican dirty tricks. You're going to love this one coming out of Arizona. Honestly, I got to give him credit. It's pretty smart. Okay. And then number two, uh, that income inequality, how we destroyed the American middle class when we returned. Young Turks. I proposed a detailed budget, Bob. I sent up my budget man to the Congress. All right, back on the Young Turks. That alarm means we're going to graphs and we're going to have nothing but fun. We're going to do that in a second. But first, uh, let me share something that John McCain uh, said over the weekend because I think it's perfectly relevant here. John McCain goes on Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace, and he's going to talk about class warfare. I found that interesting. Let's go to clip number three and listen. I hope that they'll do a payroll tax cut, but the first thing, the first thing we need to do is extend the, the, uh, the tax cuts that are in existence so people will have that certainty. Well, let rest. me ask you about that, because the Democrats are talking, and this is all reportedly at this point, uh, about framing it this way. Let's end the tax cuts for the wealthy and use that $35 billion instead to have targeted tax cuts for small business that does most of the hiring and for lower income employees. Would you support that? 
well, let's get into the old class warfare again. Let's get the rich. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, just extend the tax cuts. Then let's talk about the, uh, the payroll tax holiday, which for small businesses, which is something we have uh, fought for for a long period of time, and pay for it out of the unused stimulus funds or cut to other spending. Look, look, just extend the tax cuts for the rich first, and then we'll worry about payroll tax for the rest of you or something, okay? Go away, go away, you and your class warfare. Well, I found that interesting because, you know, I believe there is class warfare in the country. It's just that it's the rich doing it on you, the middle class, okay? And I have the numbers to back it up. So let's take a look. First, I've got an interesting chart for you guys. It's what the top 10% of this country has had as a share of the national income. And as you see it over years, let's take a look at that. That's a fascinating graph, right? So there, there it is. The top 10% are, are doing fantastic in the years leading up to the Great Depression. And then we have an enormous crash. And then actually things kind of even out and we have a, a situation where we build the great American middle class and the top 10% have a lower share of the national income. And then, of course, in the 1980s, the class warfare of the rich versus the middle class begins again. The rich starts to accumulate a larger and layer, larger share of the national income. And what happens in 2007 and 2008? Another giant crash, right? So now the top 10%, that's pretty broad. How about we look at the top 1%? Let's look at those numbers, see if that clarifies situations. So, uh, for example, in 1915, uh, the top 1% share of the national income was 18%. That's pretty high, and things were pretty rocky back then, a lot of recessions and uh, uh, ups and downs. And then in 1928, we got to 24%, the highest it's ever been. And what happened in 1929? I believe the Great Depression started, right? Uh, but then afterwards, hey, you know what? From 1953 to 1980, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, the glory years of America, where we build the middle class, the top 1%, their share of the income was only 9 to 11% for that whole time, about 10% of the uh, national income. Makes sense? Everybody's a winner, right? Now, after 1980, we go on a 30-year stretch where Republicans and Democrats who participate with them wind up agreeing with the, the class warfare that the rich have started on the middle class, and they bring that share of the national income for the top 1% all the way back up to 24%. That happened actually in 2007. We have another crash, and we still haven't fixed it, and so now it's still at 24%. Look, that income inequality is not only disastrous for all of us that are in the middle class, but it's also a bad idea for the economy overall, and it ultimately is a bad idea for the rich. Why? Because as even Henry Ford realized, I've got to pay my workers enough so that they can buy my cars. If you don't have a middle class that could buy all the stuff you're creating, eventually they're not going to buy it, and, and, and they're going to run out of money. And with the stagnant wages that we have in the country, and the rich getting higher and higher percentage, that's exactly what's happened. And that's the structural problem we have. Now, for example, from 1980 to 2005, you know what percentage of the increases of our national income went to the top 1%? 80% of the increase. So that trickle down stuff did not work. It trickled up, actually it flowed up, it gushed up. 80% of the increase in national income went to the top 1% in that time. When you're talking about class warfare, the middle class, you've been getting, You've had war committed upon you for the last 30 years. You just don't know about it. And people like John McCain go on television and go, oh, tut, tut, tut. If you ever try to even increase taxes this much, bring them back to when they were doing well under the Clinton economy. No, 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 no. Then we're going to say you're doing class warfare. Absurd. Do you know how bad income inequality has become in the United States? Now, here's a list of some countries, and there are many, many countries, some countries that have better income e equality than we do. France, we say, all right, well, you know what? I'm not sure how well their economy is doing. Well, Germany, their economy is doing fantastic, their manufacturing base. I mean, right now, of course, their economy is suffering along with everybody else because of the world recession, but they have a really strong manufacturing base. Sweden, Denmark, Spain, Canada, Australia. Wait a minute. Guyana? Nicaragua? Venezuela? They all have better in income equality than we do. Look, we used to call some of those Latin American countries banana republics. They're third world because they have a few rich 
and everybody else who's, who else is poor. That's a ridiculous way to run it. It, it eventually leads to dictatorships, etc. It's anti-democratic. It, it's not good for the economy. It's not good for anybody. <laughs> Banana republics. Now we're lower than them in income equality. We're headed off a cliff, and any time you suggest that, hey, perhaps the rich should also pay their fair share uh, of taxes, <laughs> John McCain, Republicans, every oh, no, 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 class warfare, class warfare. You know that, we showed you that chart, 1953 to 1980. You know how much the rich were paying, the top uh, income bracket was paying back then? They were paying anywhere between 70 to 94% for the top marginal rate. Not for all of their income, but once they got above a certain amount, $200,000, $400,000, etc., they would be paying 70 to 94%. And you know what happened? Our economy took off like a rocket. Now they're paying 35%. And if you try to raise it even a tiny percentage, it's, oh my God, what are you doing, class warfare? Don't believe the hype. If there's any war at all in this country, it's against the middle class. And it's done by people like John McCain, the Republican Party, and oftentimes the Democratic Party, who pretends to do otherwise but does the same thing. All right. So that's your uh, state of uh, income inequality in the country, and it is disastrous. All right. Now I, let me give you the fun uh, Republican dirty trick story. So in Arizona, apparently, uh, this is fairly well known that uh, parties have been doing dirty tricks against one another. Uh, and apparently one of the famous ones is that you get people from the other side to run to split the, the votes. Now, the New York Times in their story said that all the parties have done it before, though they gave no other instances of it. So I don't know if that's true or untrue. I do know what's happening right now. Guess which party is doing the dirty tricks? Of course, it's the Republicans. So now partly because they, it, that's what they do, and partly because the Democrats would be so scared. They're like, oh my god, a dirty trick, no way, no, 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 no. Bill O'Reilly will hit me. Right? Now, look, they shouldn't be doing dirty tricks, so I'm glad they're not doing it, but you, you know which party it was going to be. So who, wh what's happening here? Well, we've got a guy named by St uh, Steve May. He's a Republican operative there, and he's uh, also running for office himself, actually. And uh, he is um, got, got a unique plan. He's decided that he's going to grab these guys who are uh, in this part of town called Mill Avenue. They're apparently known as the Mill Rats, which is an unfortunate name. Uh, and some of them are homeless. And since the Green Party doesn't have a lot of uh, money in that area, he's going to finance them getting on the Green Party ticket so they can split the vote with the Democrats and have the Republicans, like Steve May, win their elections. So he's p collected a motley crew. There he is. There's Steve May talking. And there are the folks that are called the, quote, mill rats, who he's got running for the Green Party. Now, for example, one of them is Benjamin Percy. He's the guy in the front you see there, the kid. He's 20 years old. He's got a curious mohawk, and uh, he uh, says his campaign office is that Starbucks, and that he used to be homeless, and uh, he, he uh, runs a small business, which is him strumming his guitar on the street, and uh, that he's planning to run for office and change the way things are. But once he starts giving a speech, which he does right there, for example, he starts talking about how we can uh, cure the deficit problems by installing solar panels everywhere. Steve May, standing behind him, says, and I love this, he whispers, focus, focus, focus. In other words, don't talk about solar panels, don't do any of that stuff. The, you're not going to solve the budget deficit that way, that sounds crazy. Just talk about how you're for the people and you're a liberal, etc., so you'll trick some Democrats into voting for you. Or you'll trick some, trick some liberals or progressives into voting for you. When Steve May is asked about this, he has a very simple answer. Did I recruit candidates? Yes. <laughs> they, they're like, okay, wait, did you recruit these particular can candidates, the homeless guys and stuff? He's like, yes. <laughs> he says, but I don't control them. Except uh, when he's standing behind them while they're giving their speech and saying, focus, focus, get back on topic, right? Other than that, no, he doesn't control them. Now, who are the other guys? Uh, one of them is a 53-year-old. He's known as Grandpa. His name is Anthony Gorshin or Gashorn, I should say. There's Grandpa. He's on the Green Party ticket. Come on. Okay, uh, he uh, says that he is for um, God in the classroom, fair enough, and he's against higher taxes. Why, Grandpa? What, how, how much taxes are you paying? I mean, get a load of the wonderful absurdity of the situation. 
Republicans recruit homeless people to campaign on lower taxes for the rich. I mean, can, can anything describe the current state of our politics better than that? Meanwhile, they siphon away votes from Democrats. They have another guy here, uh, last one, uh, Thomas Meadows. He's 27 years old. Uh, he's a, apparently a tarot card reader. And he has his trademark hat, which you see there, purple and green, the jester's hat. He is running for uh, state treasurer, though he admits he has less than $1 to his name. Okay, now look, this is, it, it gets to a point where it's a cruel joke, right? And so the plan is, ha ha, he he, let's sign up these people, put them on the Green Party, split the vote, and then the Republican wins, and then says to the homeless people, see you, wouldn't want to be you. Get, get. They rough talk them and run them off. Hey, thank you very much for playing along. Now, Democrats are saying, hey, this might violate some federal and state rules, and the Republicans are saying, bite me. <laughs> They'll say, they're saying basically, yeah, we're doing it, and we'll win, and after we win, you can cry about it later. And that's the state of our American politics, unfortunately. Young Turks.